Hugh Masekela, and Ricky Rick. <laughs> I'm very excited, by the way. There's a, a request from Standard Bank and the Joy of Jazz, and they want you to do something with Ricky Rick. Would you have said, yes, yes, of course, man. Yeah, you know, when do we start? I really admire people who can play with words. I wish I could do it. I never thought that I'd be sitting with Uncle Hugh talking about just, you know, life. Forget the collaboration, just to sit here and talk about life and him to explain his story. For me, it's something that it wasn't going to happen. Not just in the conversation, from a musical standpoint also, Standard Bank didn't have to get me. It's really a blessing, and I couldn't thank Hugh enough to allow me into his circle. Wait till you get the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Music hijacked me from when I was a baby. And by the time I was two, three, I couldn't stop singing. So by the time I went to boarding school, I went to boarding school when I was 11. I had a beautiful soprano high voice. And so I was singing in the boys' choir. I did all the solos. And uh, when I turned 12, my friends said to me, we can't hang out with you anymore because you're singing the girls' part. <laughs> And I said, friends, you can't abandon me because of my voice. You know, what can I do? They said, well, you have to drink and smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the most useless thing I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> One of my uncles, he was a jazz, a jazz fiend. He had so many CDs, and all they used to do was listen to jazz, listen to old music, listen to and drink their whiskey and sex. I remember my twin brother, Major League Boys, we used to sit there thinking like, what do we do with all this music? Our growth into wanting to figure out what to do came from like chilling with all these CDs, not knowing what to do, and just fooling around. That part of like my sort of like my musicality is like, it's still with me. I lived in Austria for a while, I went to an American school. And coming from South Africa to an American school, you see kids wearing Timberland boots and you know, Tommy Hilfiger, how the hell is my mom gonna ever afford a Tommy Hilfiger or a Timberland or anything like that? There was a certain way that people walk, the cool kids walk like this. There were all these different sub genres, you know? Since that day, I always told myself that I'd try my best to always like have the best, you know, like have the best like thread and to stand out. When I grew up, I didn't know at first about fashion. I mean, I didn't care, you know, all I cared about was music. Then when I got to boarding school, my best friend is still, is one of our best trumpeters. His name is Stompy Manana. He said to me, he just said, Sonny, I can see that you like me, you know, you like us, but I can't hang with you. I said, why? He said, because you wear John Drake's. <laughs> Says, and he said it in Tsotinsar, I can't have a look more, Dr. John Drake's. Nah, 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 nah. And I said, what should I do? You have to get a, a St. Louis. Mm. And a St. Louis is a brogue shoe. It was four pounds, 17 and six. Mm. And in those days, that was a fortune. Every month I'd take seven and six and put it on the shoe. Mm. Now I can't wear any kind of wool but cashmere. cashmere. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing how little people realize how much jazz affected modern life. Before Louis Armstrong, all those guys came on the scene, they couldn't dress. They changed the way people walked. They changed the way people talked. But that first group of people that came out of New Orleans actually civilized the world. Mm -hmm.